Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. For the past few videos, we've been talking about first and second order chemical reactions, and we saw that if we know the reaction order, we can make predictions about how the concentrations of the reactants and products change over time. But it turns out that a lot of chemical reactions, including a lot of the most interesting reactions you saw in organic chemistry, are more complex than the simple reactions we've been looking at so far. Today, I want to tell you why reactions are often more complex than that. And when we understand that, we'll have a much more realistic view of how chemical reactions occur. To start with, think about the generic chemical reactions we used when we first started talking about first and second order reactions. We saw that the rate of a first order reaction usually only depends on one reactant, so we can write the rate law like this. Meanwhile, the rate of a second order reaction can depend on one reactant or two. If there's only one reactant, we write the rate law this way. And if there are two, we get this for the rate law. The number of reactant molecules that are involved in a reaction is called the molecularity of a reaction. And how do we know what the molecularity of a reaction is? Actually, this turns out to be easy. As we've seen in a few past videos, it's not possible to know whether a reaction is first order, second order, or something else without doing experiments and looking at the data. But determining the molecularity is much simpler. All we have to do is look at the balanced reaction. For example, here's a reaction in which potassium perchlorate reacts to form potassium chloride and oxygen. As you can see, there are three different product molecules, one potassium chloride and two oxygen molecules. However, there's only one reactant molecule, and that makes this a unimolecular reaction. By the way, this is a good time for me to give you an important safety tip. Compounds like chlorates and perchlorates, including this potassium perchlorate, are strong oxidizers. They undergo decomposition reactions like this one very easily, and those reactions are very exothermic, sometimes even explosive. For that reason, you should never use a mortar and pestle to grind up a chlorate or perchlorate without thoroughly reading the warning labels first. If the label warns you that the compound is a strong oxidizer, do not grind up the solid because the friction generated by grinding could be enough to set off the reaction. Anyway, next, here are two second order reactions. In the first one, nitrogen monoxide and nitro chloride react to form nitrosyl chloride and nitrogen dioxide. That means that for every reaction, molecules of these two compounds must collide. Because there are two reactant molecules that participate in the reaction, it is a bimolecular reaction. In the second reaction, nitrosyl chloride reacts to form nitrogen monoxide and chlorine. In this case, there's only one compound on the reactant side, but there are two molecules of it, meaning that two nitrosyl chlorides must collide, and that makes this another bimolecular reaction. So far, we looked at a first order reaction that's unimolecular, and two different second order reactions that are bimolecular. This might lead you to believe that the reaction order always tells us what the molecularity of the reaction must be, and vice versa, but that's not the case. Here's why. Consider this reaction, in which hydrogen gas reacts with iodine bromide to form hydrogen bromide and iodine. This reaction is first order with respect to each of the reactants, which makes it second order overall. With that information, we can write the rate law, which is this. However, as you can see, there are three reactant molecules on the left side of the equation. That seems to mean that this must be a termolecular reaction in which three reactant molecules are involved in a collision. But that's not the case. And if we think about what's happening at the molecular level, we can see why not. Here's an animation showing a bunch of gas molecules moving around and colliding in a container. However, from back in your general chemistry days, you might recall that a gas is mostly empty space. The gas molecules are actually pretty far apart. In fact, one mole of a gas occupies about 22.4 liters of space at room temperature and pressure. That means that each molecule is a distance of about 4 nanometers from the next nearest molecule. That's much larger than the typical molecule is. 
For example, a molecule of acetone has an average diameter of about 0.3 nanometers. But think about what that means. The molecules in a typical gas aren't as close together as this picture suggests. Instead, they're more spread out, like this. As a result, collisions don't happen very often, and when they do, the collisions are between just two molecules. It's very, very unlikely that more than two molecules will happen to collide at exactly the same moment. But the way we wrote this reaction, it looks like three molecules must collide to cause the reaction. Two iodine bromide molecules and a hydrogen molecule. As we just saw, a collision between all three molecules is very unlikely. So how does this reaction happen? And is it a termolecular reaction or not? As it turns out, the short answer is no. This reaction is not termolecular, and the three reactant molecules you see here don't collide all at once. Instead, the reaction doesn't happen in the simple way that we've written it at all. Instead, the reaction happens in two steps. First, a molecule of hydrogen reacts with one of the iodine bromides to produce hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide. Next, the hydrogen iodide we just produced combines with a second iodine bromide molecule to form another hydrogen bromide and an iodine molecule. When we combine the two reactions, we get the overall reaction we see at the top. The overall reaction is called a composite reaction, and each of the individual steps it took to give us the overall result is called an elementary reaction. Notice that each of the elementary reactions in this example is a bimolecular reaction because two molecules must collide during the reaction. In addition, experimentally we find out that these two elementary reactions are each second order. Remember, the reaction order must be determined experimentally. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, the composite reaction is also second order. Again, we find that out by doing experiments and figuring out the rate law. But what about the molecularity? Is the overall reaction termolecular because three molecules are involved overall? Is it bimolecular because each of the elementary reactions is bimolecular? Or maybe it's tetramolecular because two molecules collide in the first elementary reaction and two more in the second one. Actually, none of those is correct. The molecularity of a reaction describes the number of molecules that must collide in a single reaction. But the overall reaction we have here isn't a single reaction. It takes place in two steps. For that reason, it makes no sense to talk about the molecularity of a composite reaction like this one. And that will always be the case. A composite reaction doesn't have a molecularity. But the elementary reactions that make it up do. However, both the composite reaction and its elementary reactions do have reaction orders, as we've seen. This might seem like a radically different way of thinking of reactions. Basically, almost every chemical reaction you ever see, whose coefficients add up to more than two, must be composite reactions, because it's almost impossible that you'd have three or more particles colliding all at once. But actually, you're very familiar with this idea from organic chemistry. Take this reaction, for example. In this case, you have a series of steps in which 2,4-dimethyl-3-one is synthesized from methylpropanol. As you can see, this happens in three steps. First, a Grignard addition. Then, protonation of the oxygen by water. And finally, oxidation of the alcohol by pyridinium chlorochromate. The overall reaction is a composite reaction, and each of the steps is an elementary reaction. Each of those elementary reactions is bimolecular. It's also not unusual to see a composite reaction like this written this way, so that we see the overall reaction, and it looks as though it's all happening in one step, even though that's not the case. You probably saw reactions written this way in your organic chemistry course, and you were probably very comfortable recognizing that a reaction like this actually occurs in several steps. The same is true for all chemical reactions, where the coefficients add up to more than two. 
So, the elementary steps are the ones that tell us what's really going on in a chemical reaction. It turns out that almost all elementary reactions fall into one of three categories. So let's look at all three of those. Once we understand them, we'll find out that we can break any composite reaction down into a series of elementary reactions of these three types. And that'll enable us to understand the rate of the overall reaction. The first type of reaction is the reversible reaction, in which a reactant produces a product and at the same time, the products react to form the reactants. Notice that the forward and the reverse reactions here will probably have two different rate constants, which we can label K1 for the forward reaction and K-1 for the reverse reaction. The second type of elementary reaction is the parallel reaction, in which a reactant can form either of two or more products. We'll call the rate constants for these two reactions K1 and K2. An example of this would be an organic reaction in which you can get a major product or a minor product. Finally, the third type of elementary reaction is the consecutive reaction in which one reactant produces a compound which is then consumed in a second reaction. Again, the two rate constants can be called K1 and K2. The product of the first reaction is usually called the intermediate. Let's think about how we describe the rate of each of these kinds of reaction. For example, suppose we have this generic reversible reaction. There's only one reactant molecule for the forward reaction and one for the reverse reaction, so each of these will be a first order reaction. Is there a way for us to write the rate law for the entire reaction? The answer is yes, but it's not the same as the rate laws you've seen before. What we can't do is write the rate law as rate equals K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. That doesn't work because there are two different reactions happening at once here, one in the forward direction and one in the reverse. That means our rate law will have two parts. First, remember that the rate of this reaction is the change in concentration of a compound over the change in time. In this case, we have two different compounds that we could be taking the rate with respect to. We'll get a different rate law depending on whether we measure the rate with respect to A or B. So first we need to decide which one we want to measure. Suppose we measure the rate with respect to A. The forward reaction causes the concentration of A to decrease. So we have negative K1 times the concentration of A. The reverse reaction causes the concentration of A to rise. So we have a second term in our rate law, which is plus K minus 1 times B. Notice that we have B in this part of the equation and not A, because the rate law always depends on the concentrations of the reactants, even if a reactant is on the right side of the written reaction. But what if it wasn't the compound A that we were interested in? Instead, suppose we wanted to know the rate with respect to B instead. In that case, the forward reaction would cause an increase in the concentration of B. So the first term in our rate law would be positive K1 times the concentration of A. And the reverse reaction would reduce the amount of B. So the second term would be minus K minus 1 times the concentration of B. There's one other thing to notice about these rate laws that'll be a helpful guideline for us as we look at more complicated reactions. Whichever rate law we look at, notice that it has two terms. It turns out that the rate law with respect to any compound has a separate term for each reaction that the compound is involved in. So, for example, B is involved in two different reactions, the forward one and the reverse one. For that reason, the rate law with respect to B has two different terms. Next, let's look at the second type of elementary reaction, the parallel reaction. For example, suppose we have a reactant A that could give us a product B or a product C. We could also write the reaction this way, with different arrows coming out of the reactant for each of the possible products, and each with its own rate constant. 
This time, there are a total of three different compounds involved, so we have to decide which one we want to take the rate with respect to. Let's start by writing a rate law with respect to the compound A. Compound A is involved in two different reactions, so the rate law will have two different terms. Both of the reactions will decrease the amount of A, so both terms will begin with a negative sign. The first term is negative K1 times the concentration of A. And the second term is negative K2 times the concentration of A. Next, suppose we want to find the rate law with respect to B. B is only involved in one of the two reactions, so there will only be one term in the rate law. This reaction causes the concentration of B to increase, so it starts with a positive sign, and we get the rate equals K1 times the concentration of A. Again, remember that the concentration we use in the right side of the rate law is always the reactant, so we have A here, even though the rate law is describing the rate with respect to B. We get a very similar rate law for the compound C. The last type of elementary reaction is the consecutive reaction. In this one, we have a reactant A that produces an intermediate compound B, which then forms a product C. Again, the two steps have two different rate constants. We can write a rate law with respect to any of the three compounds. The one with respect to A is pretty easy because A is only involved in one of the reactions. Its rate law will be rate equals negative K1 times the concentration of A. Remember, we need the negative sign because the concentration of A, which is what we're measuring the rate for, is decreasing. The rate law with respect to B is more interesting. B is involved in both reactions, so the rate law has two terms. The first reaction causes the concentration of B to increase, so that term of the rate law is positive, and we have positive K1 times the concentration of A. The second reaction makes B decrease, so the second term is negative K2 times the concentration of B. Finally, we can write the rate law with respect to C, which will only have one term. We get positive K2 times the concentration of B. Now that we know about the rate laws for the th three types of elementary reaction, we can combine all that we've learned so far to understand the rates of some really complex processes. For example, consider this generic reaction. In this case, we have th six different compounds involved, and we have a combination of reversible, parallel, and consecutive reactions all happening at once. This might look intimidating, but it's actually not too hard to write a rate law for this reaction. Plus, this type of reaction is much more realistic than the very simple reactions we've sometimes looked at in class. Nature is more complicated than textbooks usually tell us. Let's find the rate law with respect to each of the compounds in this composite reaction. A is only involved in one reaction, so this is a simple rate law. The reaction causes the concentration of A to decrease, so the term starts with a negative sign, and we get rate equals negative K1 times A. The rate law is more complex for B. B is involved in three different reactions, this one, and also both the forward and reverse reactions here. That means the rate law with respect to B will have three terms. The first term will be K1 times A. Next, let's do the forward reaction over here. This one decreases the concentration of B, so the term will be negative K2 times the concentrations of B and C. Notice that the forward reaction here has two different reactants, and we need to include both of them in the rate law. Also, notice that this means that the forward reaction is a second-order bimolecular reaction, unlike the others that we've looked at so far, which have all been first-order unimolecular reactions. Finally, the last term is for the reverse reaction, which causes the concentration to increase. So the term is plus K minus 2 times the concentration of D, because D is the reactant here. The compound C is partnered with B in its reactions, so the rate law with respect to C is the same as for B. 
The compound D has the most complicated rate law yet because it's involved in four different reactions. So the rate law has four terms. The first is for the forward reaction over here. That one gives us K2 times the concentrations of B and C. Next is the reverse reaction, which is negative K minus 2 times the concentration of D. Next is this reaction, which gives us minus K3 times the concentration of D. And finally is the final reaction, which gives K4 times the concentration of F. The last two compounds are each only involved in one reaction apiece, so the last two rate laws are very simple. The one with respect to E will just be K3 times the concentration of D. And the one with respect to F will be negative K4 times the concentration of F. So that's it for this reaction. Some of these rate laws are fairly large, but as we'll see in just a moment, it's sometimes possible to make approximations that can simplify them a bit. The important takeaway for now is that we now know how to write the rate law for any elementary reaction, no matter how complicated the composite reaction is. The third type of elementary reaction we talked about was consecutive reactions, and these are especially important for us. We saw earlier that lots of organic syntheses and other reactions are made up of several consecutive steps, which makes consecutive reactions worth delving into a little more. Suppose we have a generic reaction like this one. Let's consider the rate law with respect to B, which looks like this. What will happen to the concentration of B if the rate of the first reaction is much higher than the rate of the second one, so that K1 is at least 10 times higher than K2? In that case, the first reaction happens very rapidly, so the concentration of A falls and B rises very quickly. But the second reaction is relatively slow, so the concentration of B decreases only slowly. That means the concentration of the final product really only depends on the second reaction. We say that the second reaction is the rate controlling reaction. What happens if the opposite is true? Suppose K2 is at least 10 times higher than K1, so that the second reaction is the fast one. As you'd guess, that makes the first reaction the rate controlling one. It also means that when B is produced by the first reaction, it gets used up almost immediately by the fast second reaction. It also means that the amount of B present at any moment will be fairly small, and the concentration of B won't change very much over time. But think about what that means. If the amount of B doesn't change much over time, that means that dB over dt is approximately equal to zero. As we'll see in some future videos, we can use that fact to simplify many of our rate laws. This approximation is called the steady state approximation because we're saying that the concentration of B is small and steady. It's a very common approximation that we make when analyzing the rates of some complicated reaction. But remember, it's only valid when we have consecutive reactions where the second reaction has a much higher rate than the first one. There's one other approximation we can sometimes make that can simplify our rate laws. Suppose we have a reaction with two different reactants, and one of the reactants has a much higher concentration than the other one. For example, suppose we have this reaction and the concentration of A is much higher than the concentration of B, at least 10 times higher. Let's think about the rate law with respect to the intermediate in this reaction, which is C. From all the work we did earlier, we can see that the rate law will be rate equals K1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B minus K minus 1 times the concentration of C minus K2 times the concentration of C. To make this look a little simpler, I'm going to factor the concentration of C out of the last two terms. So far, this is just like other examples we've done. But now, remember the concentration of A is much higher than that of B. If A is big enough, that means that its concentration won't really change very much during the reaction. Its concentration is so large that losing a little bit doesn't affect it very much. 
That means that A is essentially always equal to the initial concentration, A0. And we can treat K1 times A0 as though it's just one big constant. That means the forward reaction behaves approximately like a first order reaction instead of a second order one, as we might have expected. This approximation is called the pseudo first order approximation, and it's another helpful approximation we can make to simplify our rate laws. Remember, this approximation is only valid when we have two reactants and one of them has a much higher concentration than the other. So, We've seen two useful approximations that we can use to simplify rate laws of composite reactions. First is the steady state approximation, which tells us that in a series of two consecutive reactions, if the rate of the second reaction is much larger than the first, the rate with respect to the intermediate is nearly equal to zero. The other approximation is the pseudo first order approximation, which tells us that if a reaction has two reactants and the concentration of one is much larger than the concentration of the other, then the amount of the more concentrated one hardly changes and the reaction behaves like a first order reaction. There's one last thing to notice about our last example. If the second reaction is much faster than the first one, then we can also make the steady state approximation. You might remember that that one says that the rate with respect to the intermediate is approximately zero, so that makes our rate law this. We can rearrange this equation a little by moving the second term to the left. If we now divide by the rate constants in parentheses, we end up with this equation. But take a look at what this equation is actually telling us. It's an equation that allows us to calculate the concentration of the intermediate in this reaction. Measuring the concentration of an intermediate is often actually a very difficult thing to do experimentally. So as long as the steady state approximation and the pseudo first order approximations are both valid, this equation gives us a much easier way to find the concentration of an intermediate, which is often a useful thing to know. Well, we've learned a lot of new and useful stuff in this video, so that's more than enough for now. One thing we haven't talked about yet is the energies of these reactions, so that's what we'll talk about in our next video. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!